What an honor to be here, and I apologize um, for the complications um, that led to this lateness. Let me get started, uh, and let me first say, uh, does your, how long should I speak for? Uh, 40 minutes. 40 minutes, great. Okay. Um, so let me just uh, say that uh, there is a more finished talk that I could have given, but I intentionally decided to present something that is more raw, um, although some of the parts of this research that are a little bit more um, uh, set, I will go through that quickly, but at the beginning part is more new material, and so especially given uh, uh, that um, I knew I was presenting to this, this crowd, I felt it would be good for me to get your feedback. So let me just give that as my um, preface. Uh, call the talk, Apprentice Cooley, Popper Con Apprentice Popper Cooley Convict, um, and all three of those uh, labor subjects are going to appear in the first part of the presentation. And <clears throat> very much the, um, the impetus for this presentation is um, an inquiry into capitalism as, or colonial capitalism, as a historical force that produces a division of labor. I think of it almost as a kind of mitosis and metastasis um, using a, a kind of medical metaphor in which li bonded labor goes through a mitosis cycle um, somewhere from the 1790s through to the 1840s. Um, new forms of um, bonded labor are divided off from a kind of original cell of slavery, just as the plantation complex, um, like a metastasis, um, is moving from the Caribbean Sea and the American South to embed itself in new locations uh, across the Indian Ocean. Of course, there is a long history to the plantation, but it's particularly the capitalist colonial plantation as a formation that I'm interested in. So it's the plantation complex, and it is um, modes of bonded labor and their movement that my new research um, focuses or uh, seeks to track. Let me begin by talking about the pauper. In 1834, after the new poor law was passed through Parliament, poor law commissioners were empowered to send, quote unquote, vagrants to penitentiaries and workhouses and to send, quote unquote, deserted children to orphanages and, quote, lunatics idiots, epileptics, and cripples, unquote, to public institutions for their reform. In 1835, 15,000 parishes in England and Wales were formed into poor law unions, each with their own union workhouses. Those who were assigned to these penitentiaries were categorized by variety, by variety of pauper, as old, as able-bodied, as children, etc. Buildings were designed to segregate the different categories of inmates. The workhouses were conceived as a reforming institution in which paupers, the supposedly undeserving poor, if we, of course this is all part of the classic, part of classic research and certainly associated with um, the name of Polanyi, Karl Polanyi, these undeserving poor were to be put to work and punished as needed in order to uh, facilitate their rehabilitation. So here we have a project in um, labor reform and labor control in which bondage is being reimagined as a form, uh, as a mode of um, moral reform. One report from inside these workhouses from the years after the poor, the new poor law, the, again, this is right after 1834, and that date is important for the whole presentation, recorded the use of corporal punishment as the poor were transformed into Culprits, quote, his body was stripped down to his waist and in the yellow and sickly candlelight of the room, his heart could be seen beating rapidly against his poor thin ribs. To punish such a boy as that, half nourished and trembling with fear, was a monstrous cruelty. However, discipline was sacred and could do no wrong in a Bastille 60 years ago. The boy was lifted up the ta upon the table uh, and four of the biggest boys were called out to hold each a leg or an arm. The boy was laid flat on the table, his breeches well pushed down so as to give as much play as possible for the birch rod. The lad struggled and screamed. Swish went the pickled birch on his back, administered by the schoolmaster, who was too flinty to show any emotion. Thin red stripes were seen across the poor lad's back after the first stroke. They then increased in number and thickness as blow after blow fell on his back. Then there were seen tiny red trickles flowing the, uh, following the course of the stripes, 
and ultimately his back was a red inflamed surface contrasting strongly with the skin on his sides. How long the flogging went on, I cannot say, but screaming became less and less piercing, and at last the boy was taken out, given vent only to heavy sobs at intervals. If he was conscious, I would think only partially so." Unquote. And that is from the third report of the commissioners for inquiring into the conditions of the poor classes um, of Ireland from 1835. <clears throat> Let me juxtapose that uh, scene from inside the poor houses with um, now another context. And part of my, the method that I'm working with is the, the context of juxtaposition, just as some of my earlier work, uh, particularly entanglement, um, was a, a kind of a metaphor and a technique. Um, juxtaposition and entanglement are very important to what I'm trying to pursue here. So now let me give you um, some a scene, or at least um, paint in a picture, about convicts. In Portuguese, these are called the degradados, the degraded ones. In French, they are called the condamnés. In Dutch, they are called the verurteilende. In English, they are called the convicts. The degraded, the damned, the unlawful, the convicted and criminal. As we know from the classic scholarship of scholars such as Linda Colley and um, Claire Anderson, there was a um, swelling white convict transportation system that emerged certainly around the 1780s uh, with the American uh, revolt and revolution um, that uh, ended up sending vast numbers of white convict laborers to places um, in Australasia, across Australasia, to the Norfolk Islands, to Van Diemen's Land in Tasmania, to Queensland, to New South Wales. The scholarship especially of Robert Allen and Claire Anderson, however, has emphasized that this story about white convict labor must be supplemented um, with the story of uh, convicted brown and black bodies uh, as the Indian Ocean was transformed into a carceral, carceral sea from the 1800s onwards. So it's not only a story uh, in terms of convict labor of um, the, the convicts traveling to Australia, but also of the way in which Mauritius, the Andaman Islands, New Caledonia, Devil's Island, um, the Cocos and Keeling, so Devil's Island is in French Guyana, the Cocos and Keeling Islands, um, and the Chengu Island or Prison Island off the coast of Zanzibar, to name just a few, all of these small places, what I would like to call the small places, small islands in the Indian Ocean, um, became sites especially for, uh, the, com for, the, tran for the transportation of uh, prisoners um, from um, uh, South Asia, uh, as well as from other parts of the Bay of Bengal Rimland uh, to penal colonies. In addition to this, one might add um, also Penang, Arakan, Singapore, uh, Aden and uh, Ben Kulin. Robert Allen has estimated that um, about 100,000 South Asians were transported as convicts uh, from uh, South Asia to these locations across the Indian Ocean in the first 30 years um, of uh, the 19th century in a period that preceded the onslaught of indenture. And part of Robert Allen's argument is to uh, not consider indenture, the story of indenture, in isolation from the study of uh, convict labor. What my interest is, is in a certain counterpoint developing in the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm going to skip ahead in my slides so I can show you. OK, let me, I've ignored some of these slides. So, Juxtaposition, I'm coming back to um, the scene in the Caribbean where we talked about the workhouse. And here is an image of um, labor in a penal colony, white labor in a penal colony. But I want to come to, or I don't know if the slide will be there or not, this slide. Indian Ocean as a carceral sea. And I, wanted to, I want to just point out the, a kind of counterpoint between what I would call some of these small places in the Indian Ocean that served initially as penal colonies, such as the Cocos and Keeling Islands, New, New Caledonia, 
um, even Penang, uh, and large places in the Indian Ocean, uh, such as, um, especially when we think of plantations, such as uh, Ceylon, uh, Malaya, or Assam, and the fact that there is an interesting interplay between these small and large places. Just as there was, one might say, a dialectic between the tobacco and sugar colonies in uh, Cuba, the way that Ortiz speaks about the Cuban counterpoint, might there be uh, a certain counterpoint between um, uh, the stories of Malaya, Assam, Mauritius, and those of these penal colonies such as the Cocos and Keeling and New Caledonia. The way that I see that um, playing out is especially through the story of what was called blackbirding in the 1830s onwards, which was um, a uh, unofficial or informal process of kidnapping um, peoples from these small islands which had been converted into uh, penal colonies and then effecting a transmigration of those captured individuals, of those captives, to other larger uh, plantation, uh, emerging plantation economies. In other words, it's not just that convicts were being brought to these new islands, but that these penal colonies also became sources of labor in themselves for the transmigration uh, to the already established and developing um, uh, plantation economies across the Indian Ocean. So that, that's a, a story now about convict labor, which I'm happy to both um, maybe elaborate on a little bit more, but also get your feedback on as um, the question and answer begins. Let me now juxtapose, finally, um, a discussion uh, about apprentices and coolies from the same period, from 1830s and specifically from 1834. And don't forget that's where the first uh, example from the poor houses in Ireland uh, was drawn. In 1834, four enslaved women in Honduras named Maria, Mary Ann, Harriet, and Mary were accidentally drowned upon the river Sibun um, when it was on passage from Belize. The owner of the four women was nevertheless compensated for these um, dead enslaved women. And the reason why of course, this compensation was taking place is because slaves, even in 1830, slaves, even though slavery was, uh, were entering into the apprenticeship period, slaves were, of course, categorized not as persons, but were categorized as property. And this was lost property. We have um, Ian Bauckham's work and much work on, on um, the Zong, for example, which goes into you know, the, the kind of financial dimensions of this kind of a story. In 1836, uh, Three slave women testified that Indian coolies on Vredenhoop Plantation in British Guyana uh, Plantation in British Guyana had run away, and that um, upon being caught, quote, they tied their hands and beat them with a the rope, they tied their hands behind their backs, they beat them before the coolie houses, they licked them before the coolie house. They had licked them, they have licked them in the field. Ten different times they licked them. All ten times they licked them before the coolie house. They have licked them in the field. Rose, who was one of the apprentices, and I'm going to speak briefly now after this anecdote about the apprentice system. She was, she had been a uh, a black slave who had been transformed into a new labor category of the apprentice after um, 1834. And she told this commission, quote, those runaway coolies, those Indians who had come, recently come um, on the ships to the plantation, they got more than three licks, but I cannot say how many and cannot say if they got five. Um, uh, close quote, my insertion here. I just want to uh, emphasize this, this, this narrative of licking and of um, whipping in order to, of course, um, draw the resonance with what was happening in uh, the workhouse uh, scene. Beginning the quote again, their backs were not cut but in bumps. They uh, appeared to me as severely punished as my maidies are during the apprenticeship when they were flogged. They were flogged with the cat and nine tails, the same as was formerly in use under slavery. Some cried and some did not cry. There was no blood. 
When the blacks have been flogged, I have seen blood on their backs. I do not know what was done to the coolies after they were flogged. I do not know where they went to. I saw them go away. I went away to my work. I do not know whether they went to the sick house or not." Unquote. And the sick house, of course, on the plantation um, was a prison, um, was the, the location for imprisonment and for uh, uh, strict incarceration. The apprentice, <clears throat> who was this figure who was speaking in terms of uh, a legal category? Well, the need for cheapness of labor um, in the time of abolition was uh, emerged because of uh, international uh, competition on, on, on labor markets. And as abolition was abolished in the British Empire, there was vexed talk about the emergence already of the quote unquote second slavery. Uh, the second slavery that um, was emerging and expanding in Brazil and in Cuba and in the American South. Uh, and um, British planters said that they had to be able to compete with these three engines of industrial agricultural slave production, Brazil, Cuba, and the American South. They avowed the need um, to head off the second slavery with um, forms of um, cheap labor that they could supply on their own. In fact, Walter Rodney has pointed out that capitalist plantations always require a certain kind of labor in input. Quote, the labor must be cheap and plentiful, and even more important, the labor must be easily controlled. Unless labor can be provided under conditions that maximize industrial control, you cannot have a functioning plantation system." Unquote. Under the provisions of the Abolition Act, um, which was uh, uh, brought in and ratified on the 1st of August, 1834, this new category of the apprentice was established. The government had established three major apprenticeship categories, which carried various terms of service. The pradial attached category encompassed all slaves commonly employed in agriculture on land belonging to slave owners. Slaves engaged in agriculture on land owned by people other than their masters became what were called pradial unattached apprentices, while all other slaves became what were called non-pradial apprentices. These various kinds of labor included domestic work, dock workers, artisan workers, um, as well as, um, of course, field workers um, in the plantation fields. And all the apprentices were given a four-year term. So here we actually see the legal precedent for what would become indenture. This is the template. Appren the, the black apprentice becomes the template for the Indian coolie. The central commissioners subdivided these three categories in such a manner as would more closely reflect the, what was believed to be the true value of any individual slave. Within each group, within these groups, uh, they were subdivided according to being uh, heavily, uh, being especially able, being middlingly able, or being um, crippled or, or, or non-able. And we see that same kind of division as was taking place um, in uh, the, uh, the poor houses. Furthermore, slaves, as they entered into the apprenticeship system, they were valued. In other words, their value as part human and part chattel was established so that the slave owners could be compensated for the loss of this uh, human uh, property. The way that the system worked was that the uh, British Crown, having taken out a huge and massive loan from bankers in Britain, um, decided that it would compensate planters for one half the value of their human chattel, and that the human chattel, once converted into apprentices, would then pay back um, the slave owners themselves for the cost of their own manumission over the course of four years. So there was, in other words, there is, uh, this is something Nick Draper writes about, a very complex human accounting that was done from 1834 to 1838 um, that uh, made it the case that um, black slaves were paying their slave owners for their own um, freedom, assisted, of course, by uh, compensation from the British uh, crown. 
Now, if that is the legal category of the apprentice, of the apprentice uh, really invented in 18, from 1834 onwards and ending in 1838, then what might, how might we define the coolie? <clears throat> well, in some ways we may say that the apprentice is a premonition of the coolie or that the, co the coolie is um, a kind of afterlife of um, the slave. The original meaning of this term coolie has to do with etymologically linked to um, the term of being a bearer, being a porter, being a peon. And even in the 18th century, we see that coolies um, were petty servants uh, in, uh, in Asia, in South Asia. Um, they sometimes were involved in agricultural labor. And as we know from the classic work of scholars such as Gyan uh, Prakash, there was um, an established an extensive bonded labor um, system across um, South Asia. So what then happened as the coolie was invented at this crux of 1834? This is the same time in which the pauper was being reinvented. This is the same time in which the convict, in some ways, was being um, reinvented. And that's what I'm trying to get at in these anecdotes. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, a simultaneity in the way these different labor categories are being, in being, are being envisioned. Pradial slavery in India, in fact, meaning by pradial slavery, I mean slavery, agricultural slavery, and bonded labor in India, was used, ironically, as a justification to send Indians as now racialized coolies into a new slavery in the Caribbean or to other parts of the Indian Ocean. So here, <clears throat> we have um, a process from 1834 onwards in which forms of agricultural slavery were being transformed into new kinds of racial slavery, but ironically, racial slavery was being advanced um, in British public discourse as a kind of um, solution or rescue, uh, almost a humanitarian rescue of uh, in, of communities in South Asia from the condition of uh, the perceived condition of agricultural slavery. One slavery was being made into a kind of salvage from another in the colonial discourse. Discourses of law, <clears throat> um, especially from 1834 through to 1838 onwards, emphasized, in fact, the place of um, slavery and the abjection of slavery in India. In 1834, 38, and 1842, the government of India passed acts, the British government in India, of course, passed acts relating to um, what was called slavery in India. These acts sim uh, systematically linked both the, these subjects, the Indian pradial slave and the now waged Indian coolie in policy discussions. And indenture in this transition period came to be presented as a means of improvement, a means of reform, a means of uh, freedom. The return of the coolie trade went along with a set of committees. <clears throat> the emergence, I should say, of the coolie trade went along with a set of committees that claimed to discover the benign side of, um, uh, of coolidom or coolitude. Quote, this is from one of those reports, we may therefore safely assume that we got all the evidence of ill treatment available and that um, such, and that such uh, of our witnesses as were unconnected with the trade would be apt to smooth off nothing bad that they had witnessed." Unquote. G. A. Bushby, secretary to the government of India, writes an impassioned defense of the indentureship system focused on the freeing potential of the movement um, that kidnapping coolies ended up, in fact, to their quote-unquote advantage, uh, and uh, that the establishment of the institution of protectors would uh, aid their amelioration. And of course, the whole narrative of the apprentice was part of that uh, abolition narrative of amelioration, that the slave would be ameliorated and improved through uh, their work, um, their, their edifying work on the plantation. The Ricardian promise was that one could, quote, set slaves free and to release the enormous population of the Asian colonies from the thraldom of their local moneylenders and making them producers 
of cash crops for European markets. These freed coolies, freed from pradial medieval agricultural slavery, could then supply those needs of cheap labor serving as substitutes and surrogates for the lost um, slaves. Planters in the Caribbean pointed out that, quote, unless a system of regular continuous labor is then adopted, the cultivation of the sugarcane cannot then be carried on to a productive result. Let me read another one last portion of this about the coolies, and then I'm going to change gear and move to walk a look at some of the slides, because there's another dimension of this argument that um, is, has currently been my main focus. The development of the concept of uh, who should be a racialized coolie, who should be a racialized laborer uh, for the, this new phase in agricultural capitalism is an interesting story. And wh when I say racialized, I, I, I'm, I'm actually using the term terminology in some ways from the archive itself because, in fact, coolies were, all, were in the beginning called Indian Negroes. Indian Negro, this is a quote, Indian Negroes discharged from vessels are arriving in the ports of London. And one finds a, a lot in the 1830s language about the discovery of Indian Negroes, the discovery of the blacks of India, um, and the desire to put the blacks of India to use to supplement the loss of the blacks in the Caribbean. So who could be an Indian Negro? Well, it took early ethnographic science, and we know that there's a vast scholarship on the rise of racial science um, in this very period, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, um, that uh, came to bear on establishing which groups were most appropriate to uh, be saved, to be reformed through carceral labor. These groups initially were the Dangars and the Kols of Bengal and Bihar, communities that um, had already risen against the colonial administration in uh, revolts in the 1830s. They were Adivasi peoples um, subordinated within, um, uh, they, were, they were Adivasi peoples, sometimes also subordinated all, always, um, already, I should say, within social structures that had long been established in India itself, the caste system. But one might say that when we look at the, convi the, the, the pool of convict labor, in Indian convict labor, we should perhaps be more specific and say that a large percentage of that early convict labor that was being sent to places like Mauritius um, or places like Penang and so forth were also from these, these same groups. And these same groups, why? Because these were the groups that um, were, uh, uh, at least in the 1820s and 30s, um, the least able to be, um, to be pacified, the most uh, liable to resist um, the increasing primitive accumulation of the British in Bengal. People of the Tanga community were um, not peasant farmers. They were not menial servants on peasant farms. And yet, nevertheless, they were often um, misrecognized, one might say, as uh, pradial agricultural workers, as I have just said. There was a lot of racial imagining at work. The Dhangars were said to be no diff were said to be quite quote unquote orangutan like. They were quote an orangutan like tribe that supposedly dwelled in trees. So went um, early colonial ethnography, very much reminiscent of these early uh, visits of the um, European ethnographers to the west coast of Africa in the 1600s and 1700s. Here's quoting from one quote. I desired these persons to be sent for, and certainly they in all respects, and especially the men, justified the epithet which the villagers had applied to them. The man was short, he was flat-nosed, had uh, pouch-like wrinkles in semicircles around the corners of his mouth and cheeks. His arms were disproportionately long, and there was a portion of reddish hurry to be seen on his rusty black skin. Altogether, if crouched in a dark corner or on a tree, he might well have been mistaken for a large orangutan. The, women, the woman was equally ugly. I shall state presently why I do not take down an exact description uh, of them at the time. I should remark here that I was not that I was not, I was not like a person newly arrived from England, liable to be able to be led away by an imagination excited by the previous account of these peoples for I had seen many varieties of human race, um, from the Boschmen to the Hottentots of the Cape, 
um, eastward to Papua and to Harafora, uh, the savages of New Holland and of New Zealand um, uh, and of the Sandwich Islands. And I had looked at these two, not incuriously, but these people were evidently so different from the Dhangars that it was um, impossible not to be, um, as, I w as, as it were, convinced that they were a different race, unquote. So this says a lot. Um, and the, the, the obvious uh, way in which uh, the coolie was being reinvented as a racialized labor category you know, it, it is um, it certainly comes through the scenes scenes uh, of that quote. So I'll read one last section and then show you my slides, and then um, I will conclude. So <clears throat> behind all of these stories of the pauper, the convict, the apprentice, and um, the coolie. I would like to argue that there was what I'm calling a force economy that was emerging or that was expanding. Foucault had uh, made the observation that the 19th century um, was a period in which everyone was talking about sex. But in fact, in that discussion about sex, um, in the confessionals, um, on the streets, in the newspapers, um, there was anything but a kind of freeing of the European subject, rather with the discussion of sex came an unprecedented surveillance um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, bonding, bondage um, of the uh, modern European subject. So I'd like to propose um, something similar, that in the 19th century, of course, with the emergence of um, political liberalism, there is, an, um, un, uh, there is a continuous and growing discussion of freedom, the freedom question. Uh, to use Holtz, the, a title from Holtz's book. Um, and with that indefatig indefatigable and continuous discussion about freedom, we might also have a kind of symptom for this uh, um, expanding and diversifying uh, enactment of unfreedom. Um, that unfreedom was the, the unspoken and the expanding reality in an era of liberal freedom talk. Liberalism, as an actually existing economic practice of the 19th century, was paradoxically buttressed by the expansion of command economies, of plunder, of racism, of forced labor, what I would like to call here by a force economy, a kind of dark underbelly to what was being hailed in the light. The classic plantation zones of the Caribbean and the American South, but also the new plantation terrains across the Indian Ocean became the prime centers for the expansion, indeed the explosion, of the force economy over the course of the 19th century, ironically expanding or really um, detonating, if you like, at the very time in which we should be witnessing what was called abolition. So abolition was a name for the expansion of um, force. The global expansion of this plantation complex from the 1830s onwards was an unspoken of liberalism, the veiled domain of bondage, confiscation, coercion, degradation, that permitted the seemingly incorruptible domain of civilization and of civil society to emerge into the light. Plantation crops, especially sugar, I'll come back to him. <laughs> Plantation crops, especially sugar, cotton, indigo, tea, coffee, oil palm, and jute, and the labor of enslaved and diversely um, bonded indentured peoples um, became and not just indentured, but uh, various kinds of pauperized communities. And there's an interesting story about um, European paupers, um, also from continental Europe, being sent to the old plantation colonies, as well as convicts. These diverse, these diverse groups became the main sources of imperial wealth during the decades of high and late liberalism. Typologically, one might define two basic modes of for commanding labor. One uses the wage mechanism. The other uses the mechanism of coercive force. This ideal typical distinction is helpful as a heuristic, even as wage and coercion are often imbricated in actually existing relations of production. The wage mechanism works by promising the worker a certain rate of compensation for her investment of energy and time. 
the worker is depicted as making a rational economic calculation about whether to consign her labor for a particular wage or whether to search for another employer. In Marxian analysis, this apparent market-based activity is shown to lead to the worker's expropriation as the market conspires to pay a worker only as much as is necessary for her daily reproduction. The employer, or capitalist, thereby captures what Marx would call the surplus value that flows from the worker's industrious and creative activity. Not only is the worker robbed of the value of her work, but the very conception of work uh, as that which opposes leisure and as a set of repetitive, modular tasks in service of the demands of an abstract market estranges, alienates, dehumanizes, and evacuates the person. This is all, of course, according to Marx. Of importance to what I'm interested in is the following observation. According to Marx's conception, labor under capitalism is commanded th through purely economic means, meaning through means that are based on the calculation of exchange value, the rational function of the markets, and the wage mechanism, whereby the worker's own calculations of marginal benefit leads to her expropriation. At the core of Marx's analysis is the wage and wage slavery, which allows for, quote unquote, free exploitation of man by man. But there is another mechanism for commanding labor, often associated with the pre-capitalist past and with, quote unquote, traditional society. This mechanism uses brute coercive force, the lash, the whip, the cat o' nine tails, and requires the worker to carry out specific work in order to barely survive, to barely win reprieve from punishment or extinction. This mechanism operates on the boundary between survival and death, and as opposed to an economy driven by calculations of marginal surplus, this economy is driven by the dread fear of pain, reprisal, humiliation, and annihilation. Drawing on discussions uh, and rich discussions about primitive accumulation and its continuation into the modern period and as a foundation for of modern capitalism, and I cite here Tomich and Harvey, Shivji and Sanal, I refer to this economy throughout this paper as the force economy in order to contrast it with the, co the economy of the light, the wage economy. David Harvey discusses the various features of quote unquote primitive accumulation as delineated initially by Marx, including the forceful expulsion of indigenous peoples from their lands, the enclosure of commons, the conversion of existing or customary property rights into private property rights, the militarized extraction of wealth from colonized peoples, the bondage of people through indebtedness and the slave trade. Isa Shivji interprets primitive accumulation as a form of economic activity that requires what he calls extra economic force. And that's the, the force that um, was expanding uh, e after 1830. Indeed, a variety of scholars drawing on Marxian analysis and, coer and concerned with the articulation of racism and colonialism together, drawing on great work by W. Du Bois, uh, by Eric Williams, um, Cedric um, Robinson, uh, and then you know more contemporary art, uh, scholars since then, scholars interested in this deep articulation of racism and colonialism, or if we like, in the study of what might be called racial capitalism, in which racism is not an attribute or a supplement to capitalism, but is in fact its DNA, is in fact its uh, inherent constitutive um, logic. Those scholars emphasize the persistence of the force mechanism within capitalism as one of capitalism's most salient features. The force mechanism commands labor through mortal violence, as I've been saying. Ideologies of race, civilization, and gender established assignments for who would participate in the force economy of modern racial colonial capitalism. And the reason I would say that we have this kind of synchronicity of 1834 is because modern racial colonial capitalism um, was being put on new footing, was being consolidated in a very important way in this decade. The force mechanism was applied to groups defined as savage and uncivilized, childlike, and therefore needing of reform, slothful and degenerate, and tending towards vagrancy and criminality. Groups considered to be outside modern time, the waste and detritus of the historical process were subjugated to the force mechanism 
of labor extraction. And ironically, uh, because of this racialization, their very punishment was then encoded as a force, as a form of their improvement. Um, uh, and one might say, and I'll just, I won't read any more of this particular section, but I would just say that in some ways the classic subject or figure uh, at the core of the force economy was the black worker, was black labor. Uh, and, and I think that helps us perhaps explain why uh, the category or the symbol of blackness was traveling um, through, uh, through these routes in the 1830s, whereby even the black was being seen in the poor houses um, of Ireland um, or England. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes of this presentation, I'd like to now turn to some more settled material that um, I have completed in this project. Uh, here is, what I'm gonna do now is just speak about, I've spoken about how categories of labor were emerging, juridical categories, cultural categories of labor, um, of black labor in the 1830s. But I want to now, in some ways, look at this, the history of capital uh, that's taking place as the other side of the coin. Um, if we look at phases of industrial agriculture, we see that um, you'll see the uptake of uh, the 1830 to 1850 period. In other words, even though plantation slavery was coming to an end with abolition in the British Empire uh, in 1834, followed by abolition eventually in the American uh, North American world in 1865, we see that um, this went along with the expansion of global agricultural enclosures. That expansion required primitive accumulation of lands, but also inquired, required the unprecedented um, command of migrant labor. Um, this plantation economy, we might recognize it more through its cultural history, through the various kinds of commodities and the cultures of consumption that it produced. And part of what I'm interested in is not that story um, that I think we're familiar with, which is the story about the flows of labor coming out of the deep labor wells of Asia. But obviously, I think from what I've said, I'm interested in more of a juxtaposition of the way that labor is being, um, new labor is being conceived of and exploited simultaneously in different parts of the world simultaneously. But furthermore, I'm interested in a counter migration. So if there's a, if an overall migration of labor that is being trans shipped from uh, the Indian Ocean to places like the Caribbean, that's the classic story that we, uh, not just a story, but that's the classic uh, phenomenon of indentured labor that we're familiar with, this counter movement is equally important for us to capture what's going on in this period, um, which is the counter movement of capital, crops, techniques, and institutions that are in fact flowing out of the Caribbean Sea and out of the American South and implanting themselves onto locations, the small places and the big places of the Indian Ocean. So there is a, there is a, a kind of a, a full cycle here that we, can, um, that we can trace. The plantation complex itself has many different features to it, like a kind of metastasizing cell. Um, it includes finance, uh, logistics, um, forms of labor control, um, horticultural techniques of uh, scientific techniques of monocropping and fertilizing and manuring the land. There were, uh, the plantation complex, this is only to say, um, was a, an innovation um, that uh, emerged certainly in the 1500s um, in its newest capitalist, modern capitalist form, but was being highly um, innovated and in a, at an accelerated pace from the 18, early 1800s onwards. These images um, show the actual movement of the plantation complex, of plantations themselves and the capital networks that made them, the networks of capital that made them possible. 1710, plantations are located almost exclusively on the uh, American seaboard. By 1838, which is the time, the period in which my talk begins, we see that um, plantations have already spread to parts of Africa, both east and west, but also to um, uh, locations across um, the rimland of the, especially the Bay of Bengal. By the time that we come to 1920, 
uh, we see a global plantation belt. This is drawing on the work of um, George Beckford, a Caribbean economist who, who really told this story in his book on persistent poverty. Um, and we see how plantations have really uh, established themselves across uh, between the tropics of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, uh, it's a messier story than that, but that's one way of understanding this transition. And I've already spoken about this, these small places of the Indian Ocean which become uh, centers of labor supply for those plantation, those larger plantation sites. The plantation um, <clears throat> labor system uh, was, so this is very interesting, scholars have noted, we, we would be familiar with the argument that the prisoner of the uh, 19th century had been reinvented and that um, Benthamite forms of the panopticon, the keeping of prisoners in cells so that they could have a search, for their soul, a search of their souls, that they could come to repentance, uh, that they could um, confess, that those modes, modes of imprisoning the European subject actually contrast very strongly with the ways that these other subjects that I began my talk with were being imprisoned. They were being imprisoned in groups. They were often being chained together. They were working in, cha <coughs> in chains together. They were being housed in barracks. Um, they were being uh, subjected regularly to the whip um, and to corporal punishment. So in fact, um, we, may, we may need to supplement our uh, familiar understanding of um, biopower um, through you know, Benthamite uh, surveillance <clears throat> with the other side of the story, which is the really the global expansion of a new kind of prisoner, the prisoner working um, in groups on the field for global capital. The <clears throat> ways in which this labor, this form of carceral labor was uh, metastasizing can be traced materially in a variety of ways. And this will be the last topic that I talk about before I end. One of those ways is by looking at the travel of plant, uh, plantation manuals. These manuals um, not only out, uh, laid out the horticultural science that was needed to begin monocropping, but also laid out the techniques of labor control, specifically you know, catalogs or indexes of the number of whippings that one needs to produce various kinds of effects or to affect various kinds of discipline, um, the techniques of how to transform human beings into um, chattel slaves. And these, these uh, manuals, which were written in places like Jamaica and Haiti, two places, or Saint-Domingue at the end of the 18th century, those two locations being in some ways the, the jewels of the crown of the first British and French world empires, um, those manuals became the classics for the uh, development of the new plantations in places like Malaya, Penang, um, Ceylon, and Assam. And one can actually trace the, uh, the reference to these texts uh, from the Indian Ocean, uh, and the, the movement of these texts from the Caribbean Sea to the Indian Ocean. One might also mention Cuba and Brazil and the American South as other sites out of which this know-how, this expertise of um, labor control and plantation science were emerging. Technology was also traveling from uh, the Caribbean, the, what we might call the Circum-Caribbean, the gin house, the vacuum pan, uh, and various other technologies, many of which had in fact been innovated by slave engineers themselves, even though they often bore the name of um, the planter capitalists. Um, the plantation crops were also moving, and this is a longer story of circulation that you know, sugar and indigo and um, various other seeds, cotton had initially come out of the Indian Ocean itself, um, were however developed into monocrops for global capitalism. When I say that, really I mean for um, the markets being run out of Liverpool and Manchester and uh, Paris and Amsterdam um, and Boston and New York. But by the time that we come to the 18 uh, 20s, 30s, and onwards, these seeds have been perfected. There is something called New Orleans cotton seed, which is considered to be especially valuable. Uh, thank you. And, though, and these are being planted now um, in, across the Indian Ocean. Okay, so 
What I've done thus far in my research is I've um, traced the ways that, let me go to this image. Okay, this will be my last image. I've traced the ways that capital is moving between the old plantation uh, sites of the Caribbean and new plantation horizons or frontiers in the Indian Ocean. Um, I, with the help of Nick Draper, um, who many of you know has, uh, is in charge of the um, Legacies of Slave Ownership project at UCL, um, he's helped me to so far identify 97 distinct instances of planters of, of slave owners who were compensated from the British Crown, remember I mentioned that um, at the beginning, and who reinvested their money in the East Indies, right? Sometimes they invested it directly into new plantations. Sometimes they invested it into logistics. Sometimes they invested it in um, penal colonies, uh, in, a, in a variety of um, financial ventures. But one can trace um, quite uh, concretely the way in which a good portion of capital that was freed up through abolition and the slave compensation of 1834 to 38 moved across the seas uh, and allowed for this uh, development of um, the plantations in the Indian Ocean world. And from this, we see that it's increased, especially out of places like Jamaica, Grenada, and Guyana, that um, uh, the compensation monies are being uh, freed, and they're being transferred to places like Bengal, Mauritius, but also to various um, agencies and ventures of um, the Indian Ocean, uh, sorry, of the East India Company. I could give some examples of these, but I, I won't. I think I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to overdo it. But let me just end with one last reflection, which is that um, in this paper especially, which is you know what's different about what I've just presented is it's more about it's me trying to think about the emergence of carceral subjects as part of this story of capital. My my focus thus far has really been on the capital, but I'm interested in how do I link that to the emergence of different new kinds of labor and ways that um, the convict, the apprentice, the coolie, and the pauper were in fact caught up in, um, in, in kind of the same gale winds of capitalism, not just for abstract reasons, but because in fact capitalists themselves were, were the same capitalists were involved in these different operations in different parts of the globe. So there's a kind of a personalizing of the story and a, and a making of the story concrete that I'm really um, interested in. But from a more abstract perspective, I wonder whether we can see in this narrative the way that for the 19th century liberal citizen with habeas corpus to be invented and hailed, there had to be the necessary creation simultaneously of a highly differentiated, uh, differentiated colonial um, system of labor that the creation of the citizen required as its necessary opposite the creation of the, the criminal um, and in some ways the story of the transfer of the plantation complex gives us one concrete way to trace that creation of the criminal labor of the carceral um, uh, uh, laborer um, and of the expansion of the force economy from within liberalism itself. So let me end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Sure. I'm going to invite uh, Paget. I'm going to invite Paget Henry, um, our wonderful colleague from Africana and sociology, an and a scholar of uh, <laughs> an, an important scholar of the Caribbean to make some comments on the paper that you pre-circulated to some of us. Um, so Paget. And then we'll open and then we'll open up the floor to conversation broadly. <clears throat> okay, I shall be quick and brief. Uh, <clears throat> and my comments uh, will focus. Uh, more on what has happened to uh, this plantation system, right? Uh, 
in the period uh, <clears throat> that goes beyond uh, Chris's uh, presentation. Uh, his presentation uh, <clears throat> really looks at the evolution of the plantation system uh, <clears throat> in three broad phases, the 1640s to the 1730s, the 1730s, 1791, 1870s to 1930. And, uh, you know, as somebody who literally just came back from British Guy what was British Guyana, uh, a few days ago, I was there celebrating the work of Clive Thomas, and Clive Thomas is one of the people that Chris uh, references uh, in in the paper. Uh, and there's just so much, uh, you know, that he talks about uh, that I actually ran into uh, when I was uh, in Guyana four days ago. <clears throat> So in terms of uh, historical detail about uh, the nature of the labor forces uh, generated or required by the plantation system, I think the work that you're doing is pathbreaking. That uh, it is certainly you know, an advance over what we've done so far uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, that the level of historical detail that uh, you have now uh, put out here uh, about um, the system that developed, and in particular, its, it, its global expansion, you know, the connections across the Indian Ocean, even in Beckford's book, is not developed in this kind of detail. So in that sense, I think it's a real, real contribution. And I really, really appreciated that. <clears throat> so not being a historian, somebody who doesn't go into archives, I have nothing to add. I'm just so delighted that you've done it. So what I thought I would do is just say, well, OK, uh, what happened after 1930 to these plantation economies? Where did they go? What happened to them? Right. In fact, are they still there? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I just want to say very briefly that <clears throat> uh, after 1930, what we had was an attempt, uh, and a very indigenous attempt, to break out of this plantation system. There was an inherent skepticism about its value. Uh, it's very much racial capitalism still. And the race relations, right, are not only between blacks and whites, but also between Afro-Caribbeans and Indo-Caribbeans, right? Really, really tense uh, relations. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and so there was this deep skepticism about, uh, you know, whether or not this plantation system was going to deliver what we were told uh, it should deliver. <clears throat> and so uh, somebody like Clive Thomas, uh, George Beckford, Norman Gervin, uh, contributed greatly, particularly along with the Latin American scholar Raul Pradesh, <clears throat> to a different way of looking at Caribbean economies. In particular, a structuralist approach to uh, economics. And uh, <clears throat> this particular structuralist approach to economics, as you know, well, you may or may not know, became the fundamental theory, uh, economic theory, in uh, both ECLA and UNCTAD. Huh? And uh, this drive to see these economies you know, in a post-plantation light right, really peaked in 1974 when UNCTAD got the UN General Assembly right, to take a vote you know, on this new economic approach uh, to these ex-plantation 
uh, or at least we thought we were, ex-plantation uh, economists. <clears throat> right? And uh, so basically, what we got was this new economics that called basically for three things. One, <clears throat> it called for a careful and selective delinking from uh, global capitalism. Right? You wanted to change your relationships with global capitalism. Second, <clears throat> uh, many, in particular somebody like Clive Thomas, felt that you had to go socialist, that uh, the very nature of capitalism was such that the inequalities would only keep generate, regenerating themselves, and that you needed some systematic process of redistribution right, to counter that pattern. So there was a strong socialist turn uh, to this movement. Right? And third, right, what we had <clears throat> uh, was in order to facilitate, oh, I should say, you delink right, from the global economy, but the intent is to do some internal reforms and then relink. So it's not like a permanent, permanent break with global, the global economy. You want it to relink on different terms. Right? So to facilitate this relinking on different terms, right? <clears throat> uh, Prabish, uh, Thomas, Lloyd Best, George Beckford <clears throat> called for a set of economic reforms of the global economy that would help to make it more supportive of the kinds of internal reforms that uh, followed from their whole structuralist approach to uh, these ex-plantation economies. Right? <clears throat> uh, these this set of global economic reforms were summed up in that bold call for a new international economic order. Right? And if you take this call for a new, new international economic order together with the package of structurally based reforms that emerged uh, in the Caribbean and Latin America, right, around 1974, <clears throat> right, I think you get a very good idea. To me, it's, it's almost like the, the, the apogee of uh, the period uh, <clears throat> that Chris is calling the emergence of the third world or third worldism. That when I think of third worldism, right, to me the core of it is these particular sets of reforms, right? They were articulated with economic rigor, originality, and political intensity. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, they wanted change, you know? Uh, so that, for example, they talked about stabilizing commodity prices, a particular code for the behavior of multinational corporations, right? Support for balance of payments problems, terms of trade problems, and of course, at that particular point in time, rising debt problems, right? A lot of these problems were arising because of the fact that in 1973, you had this dramatic rise in energy, I should say, oil prices, right? <clears throat> Destabilized everything. <clears throat> okay, so what happened here? This, uh, to me, was met with absolute resistance from the Western powers, right? This, instead of what should have been a dialogue, to me, it was a reintroduction of the kind of relationship that you had during the plantation period. That the dialogue, uh, you know, was just so one-sided that, uh, <clears throat> well, let me just make a long story short. Uh, you know, 
the fact that we had all of these economic problems emerging in the late 70s, uh, by 1982, you had 70, 70 developing countries knocking on the doors of the IMF. In that state of vulnerability, right, <clears throat> the dialogue between North and South ceased to be a dialogue. Right? You know what happened. Overnight, all talk of the NIEO, the New International Economic Order, was gone. And uh, it was replaced, of course, by structural adjustment. Right? That stabilizing third world economies through austerity right, became the big the so-called Washington Consensus. And it is in this context, right, that uh, this idea of third worldism uh, basically disappeared. Now, what to me is important is that uh, in 2008, this whole thing collapsed dramatically. Huh? And the very principles upon which post the, 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 the uh, structural adjustment, uh, you know, was, was, was founded. <clears throat> the US, the Britain, they all contradicted it, right? So that the US has, so far has spent $23 trillion rescuing uh, its economy, a level of state intervention that is unprecedented, in contrast to the, the crisis in the Asian countries where the IMF imposed austerity, right? Uh, so we see this difference in treatment. But for me, what's important, right, is that we are once again at a moment where the discursive space is open, mm -hmm. right? That uh, it cannot be monopolized by neoliberalism, right? The experience with neoliberalism has been a, such a dramatic failure, right? So it is up to us now to pick up those discourses that we began when we started putting together, right? Ideas about new international economic order, all that stuff. We need to revisit those. I'm not saying they are accurate. We need to look at how they have aged, right? correct what needs to be corrected, and really begin to move forward. The space is open. Right? And I just really want to thank you for telling us in such great detail uh, about this earlier period uh, in the history of these plantation economies. And so I just thought I would say a little bit about where they are today. Thank, thank you. you very much. <clears throat> So, uh, like Patrick, I'm not. All, I'm also not a historian, and I thought I would invite your the engagement of historical knowledge with contemporary knowledge. Mm -hmm. I uh, take you to be making two arguments: one that primitive accumulation was not simply premised upon wage, but also force; and second, that the rise of the liberal subject in the 19th century was premised upon denial of liberal freedoms to, um, to a very large section of the population. <clears throat> I, in the interest of time, we are getting late, and we have to leave by five. Um, I will not comment on the second. Um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, John Stuart Mill's distinction between white colonies and non-white colonies. White colonies deserving of freedom and non-white colonies not deserving of freedom. I think that's about, it's a clinching argument for support of what you're saying. Because here is the father of modern liberalism. I mean, I'm a political scientist. So I'm, you, know, you look at John Stuart Mill, the father of modern liberalism. In the 1860s, making this claim about non 
slight uh, variation which might be introduced there, uh, which is that he's extremely liberal on women. Uh, whatever he said about non-white colonies, but he wants women to be included in the liberal sphere of freedom, which is a, perhaps the first big move by a political face. On the first question, primitive accumulation, uh, I, the argument that it's a, it's a confluence of force and weight uh, may well apply to the 19th century and first three decades of the 20th century. But there's another argument that emerges after the 1950s in economics, and then I'll give you the empirical example. And that's W. Arthur Lewis, W. Arthur Lewis. Mm -hmm. And the Nobel Prize winning insight about economic development and with unlimited supply to labor. Mm -hmm where the claim is that you can extract labor from the agricultural sector into the industrial or slash modern sector, um, so long as uh, the differential between the two remains substantial, but the extraction of, of labor from agricultural sector and the modern sector nonetheless benefits the agricultural sector because agricultural wages are so low. Mm -hmm. So this is a Nobel Prize winning idea. And it's a black economist. The only black economist who's ever won the Nobel Prize in economics, right? Uh, from which part? St. Lucia. Yeah, St. Lucia, right? Yeah. Um, now, its biggest example, uh, there have been examples, small examples of this argument, but the biggest example has come from China. If you go to Guang Guangzhou, or if you go to Shanghai or Beijing, you can you go walk into any industrial factory or walk into any restaurant and ask where people have come from who are serving you. They've all come from the village. And if you ask them whether they've been forced to come, or if you look at the wage differential between what they earned in the villages and what they earned here, you can clearly see that they don't want to go back. And indeed, 600 million people have been lifted out of poverty this way in China. So the sickest man of Asia in the late 1940s now enjoys a, a GDP of $10 trillion and a poverty rate below 10%. Poverty rate below 10%. And the mechanism for that, all, almost all uh, economic historians, economic development, not historians, economic development specialists have argued is precisely this. The wage differential between the agricultural sector slash rural sector and the modern slash industrial sector without force being applied. Now, this may, you, this may sound somewhat paradoxical because we're talking about China and not about a country which has political freedoms, but on economic freedom, all available data suggests that wage differential is, is, is triggering the migration and also has ended, more or less ended, mass poverty in, 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 that, in a country which has the largest concentration of poor people in the world. So I, I invite you to reflect on the post uh, W. Arthur Lewis situation and ask whether what you described is specific to 19th century and first three decades of the 20th century, or it's specific to plantation economy, or is it a general theory of primitive accumulation? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Two great questions. Um, oh, one wonderful reflection. Uh, I'll say about what uh, Padgett has um, said. First, I wanted to just reflect back. I thought that was quite a, a, a brilliant um, statement about the period from about 1962 to 1974 as uh, this moment of real, well, it was a, it was, it was a, a decade of uh, transformation and of um, new thinking of third worldism. The coming of the New World Journal, for example, is a, a concrete example of that and the network um, that spread across um, the Caribbean as well as the diaspora places like Montreal and London, um, where this new thinking was taking uh, place um, is absolutely fascinating, and that connects with, in my mind, with you know one of the observations that W. E. Du Bois, of course, makes in um, Black Reconstruction, where after 1877, um, or after 1865, I should say, there was a period again of possibility um, in which there were true transformations taking place on the ground in the South, and then there was a, a kind of shutdown. So these moments of an almost interregnum in which terms are being reinvented, in which the old hegemony has ended, um, seem to uh, either they last in for decade-long periods, or maybe the lesson to learn is that um, you know, we are standing in one of them right now. And I, that just is a fascinating reflection on the imperatives of our moment uh, and, and our, our historical awareness of what's happening uh, today. So thank you for that. Um, 
in terms of uh, Ashutosh? Yeah. Yes. Um, and in terms of your um, reflection, I would just say that <clears throat> the Arthur Lewis thesis was fast, interestingly uh, counterposed, of course, to the thesis um, by um, Lloyd Best and Carrie, Lewin, Levin, uh, Carrie uh, Polanyi Levitt, uh, who developed the, uh, the, the plantation firm theory to understand the Caribbean economy, and actually did that very much w with the cr crosshairs being on the Lewis model. Um, and so in some ways, Lewis's model was an object of critique for the very group that was developing this new and free Caribbean thought in some ways of the 1960s and 70s, a very, uh, a, a very critical uh, approach that was more in line with Marxian analysis, structural analysis, and less in line with a more liber liberal um, tradition of classical, let's call it tradition. And of course, we can understand why Lewis would have won the Nobel Prize, um, given the school that he was working out of. So, uh, so I would say that I'd first just be um, quite, uh, you know, open with the fact that my approach is uh, very much based in the the Beckford, Girvan, um, uh, Lloyd Best, Carrie Polanyi, uh, Carrie Polanyi Levitt school, um, which would see this not as a story of the 19th century, but as a story of the present in a certain sense, which would actually interpret um, what was happening in the 1950s and 60s not as the kind of assimilation of, or incorporation of a early modern, or pre-modern, or agricultural sphere into the modern economy, but rather in the ways that within the very heart of the modern economy was um, a, a center of primitive accumulation that it was dependent upon. So, and this, you know, harkens back in some ways to, um, to, to the analysis that, um, uh, that Rosa Luxemburg or even, or even Rudolf Hilferding might have um, offered at the turn of the uh, 19th, at uh, the turn of the 20th century. You know, let's take it back actually to that moment just to say this divide between the classical economic analysis and what might call a kind of Marxian economic analysis, we see refracting through 200 years of, of intellectual history. And if we go to the period before the First World War, there were the Schumpeters of the world who said, no, primitive accumulation and imperialism are, in fact, aberrations. They are the past. That's the, that's the early modern economy. That is going to be stamped out by modern, liberal, free trade. And so we do, you know, and he was writing in the, in the very um, context of what would become the First World War. Um, meanwhile, you had the Hilferdings the Rosa Luxemburgs, um, the Lenins, uh, Lenin very derivative of um, Rosa Luxemburg, of course, who are saying, no, in fact, the primitive accumulation that we're witnessing today and the rise of imperialism is, in fact, the very DNA. It's the very signature of this economy. And it is going to lead to world war. So, so in some ways, um, I think it's just interesting to observe that these two sides have been Pitting, uh, pit against each other for a long time, um, but um, I come down uh, uh, clearly, I think, on the side of, of, of Best and, and Polanyi Levitt, and I see that the brilliance of their analysis is to take the plantation um, as the fundamental form of economic activity of the Caribbean, um, and that plantation firm, as they would say, is necessarily dependent on varieties of forms of unwaged labor, um, whether that be the labor that is uh, of um, incorporating women, children, uh, and reproductive power into the economy, um, whether that be forms of um, incorporation that involve forcing people to work without wage. And perhaps the question that we could ask about the China example is, can we stop with a kind of self-reporting of satisfaction or not? I mean, is that the basis on which we are to determine whether a transformation in the economic system is, um, you know, how we, were, how we are to ana analyze it? 600 million people have to work about it. It's not just self-reporting. No, it's uh, perhaps not self-reporting, but I, 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 I hear you. I'm not necessarily, I don't, don't disagree with, with those um, with those facts, but I think with the, the scholarship that um, you know, people like um, Kalyan Sanal have done, or are, have, have done, he passed away, of course, recently, or those who are doing scholarship on that key theme of precarity and precariousness, um, and 
the dark economy that is not necessarily illuminated by the very te techniques, technologies, instruments, and indexes that the classical economist uses. The question is, is there something incalculable that we are not able to take, take account of that is actually happening, right? And I think that's where bringing in this other side um, makes us think. All right, glad you're here. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think you're right uh, to note that despite my uh, interest now in turning to the question of, uh, of the laboring subject, um, it remains at the level of discourse, meaning it remains at the level of, um, of, of dominant discourse. And it, these are the ways that the labor was being spoken about. These are the ways that juridic categories were developing. Um, these are the ways that, this is not who the laborer is, this is how the laborer is being represented within a certain kind of archive, uh, which is the archive of the state. So that, I think, is very true. I don't think that's the end of the story. And I think the, you know, the gesturing towards Judith Butler um, and to uh, the ways in which the study of subject formation is also a, sub a study in, um, in, in disruption and in the gaps and in the, um, the, the, the unexpected, in fact, um, uh, as central to what we must capture when we're, um, when we're reading texts from the past, uh, I would like to go there. It's just I haven't gotten there yet. And I think the way to go there, of course, would be you know, to think about using different kinds of um, materials, different textualities, the, the oral history accounts, um, uh, to whatever extent one can find um, records uh, of, um, you know, life writings of uh, workers themselves, these laborers themselves. But frankly, another source that I'm increasingly interested in um, is contemporary literature, contemporary art. So I do see this work, although I am a historian, I see that what I would like to do is to engage with um, plantation literatures from these different locations as a way of gesturing towards, again, what cannot be captured in the, the historian's archive, which are, which are specifically examples of embodiment, of gesture, of, um, of affect, of creativity, of generativity, which are not yet in the story that I'm telling. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Quick, yes. uh, just following on your last comment, uh, suggesting <laughs> maybe more than a question, which is, uh, do you know Lisa Loeb's work? I do, yeah. Yeah, so I was just, as you were talking about how the, the decision was made about which populations in India were to be coolies or indentured laborers, and I think you mentioned, I may be misremembering, that they were often groups that had already shown resistance to imperial rule, but mm -hmm. her work on how the, the indentured labor system actually comes about in 1804 in a secret memorandum, mm -hmm. which is in response to the Haitian Revolution, right? So there's mm -hmm. already a connection there between mm -hmm. those two moments of possible revolts mm -hmm. or disruption, that the indentured labor system is not just a solution to 
that might be another way of tying together these really nuanced ways we've been thinking mm -hmm. about inequality about a labor across a uh, global kind of sphere. Right, these intimacies. Right, yeah. well, and just these moments yeah. of um, possible revolution or plan for revolution that don't come to pass. Right. And how these categories and these discursive constructions are meant to contain subjects right. moving from slave to re revolutionary. Precisely because those subjects cannot be controlled by the extant you know, state discourse. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I actually was wondering, because um, you said something quite interesting, I mean, you kind of moved on, and I was like, whoa, but wait a minute. Um, you asked about how we supplement our understanding of the carceral state, particularly when we uh, were talking about Bentham and perhaps the, the shortfalls of Benthamite mm -hmm. sort of thinking and, mm -hmm. and political power theories about power and discipline. Yes. And I'm wondering, I guess, where you see the plantation uh, yeah. as sort of fitting in that because it is a, to me, sort of a, a, a conundrum because you have something like uh, the camp, right, that comes out in Agamemnon that tries to fix, that tries to sort of be a revision of the prison, but that doesn't account for this question. Of labor, Absolutely. Which I yeah. think is actually a really fascinating and right. mystifying sort of, sort of uh, piece of the equation. And so I guess I'm just curious to hear more about how you see the plantation as being a possible new Absolutely. Right. I mean, if, so that's a brilliant question. And um, it, the first thing I would say is that probably one of the most trenchant critiques one could make of Agamben is that for him, con con the con consent concentrationary camp, as he calls it, um, begins in the context of um, the Holocaust, when in fact that really many historians would say begins much earlier and um, begins in the plantation itself. That is, the mo that is where we need to go to, to understand the, the emergence of the camp um, as, a, um, as a form of uh, modern um, uh, control and um, power. So that, I think, is already an important observation. And I feel I'm going in that direction, you know, and trying to explore the plantation exactly for this kind of um, uh, this, 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 this role that it plays as a key signifier for the modern. Um, but I would also add to this that in my thinking, especially the writing of Sylvia Winter has been, has been a key importance because, you know, and many of her students as well, when they um, write, for example, when someone like Catherine McKittrick writes of the plantation as not just existing in where we, can, can, where we think of the plantation today, but as a kind of uh, as, as showing up, as popping up in the mundane, everyday life of the racialized subject. I think that's already, again, a very fascinating observation. But I think from Sylvia Winter's, from Sil Sylvia Winter's analysis, the way that she would interpret the modern condition um, as a story, as a, what she would call the autopoiesis of man, the, the, the self-narrating of the racialized white man, um, and the, the ways in which the quote-unquote um, diselected groups have to um, are, are the, always the foil for that figure, man, as he emerges through history. I think that we could see this site of the plantation as, the co as perhaps the most important concrete site in which what Sylvia Winter has spoken about is taking place, where we can actually see it instantiated. Um, and if, you know, and, and very materially, if we connect the lo the the plantation spaces across the world and think of the plantation spaces in their broadest form, including the, not the Benthamite prison, but the penal colony, um, including you know, the convict lease system, including the ways that the mundane plantation pops up in modern life, it's in those locations today that we see the continuing production of diselection so as to allow for the emergence of a narrative of selected man, right? So I, I do think there is, there is that world historical st story that this is involved in. And I think, for me, um, moving to Sylvia Winter allows for me to grasp that. You know, I think it's, it's, she's, for me, is the root for um, understanding how the plantation is not just a geography, but it is an analytical, it's a lens.
Thank you very much, Chris. It's yeah. five, and I was told that we actually yeah. have to vacate the room because there's another event now. Yes, sure. I, um, it, was, it was fun. Thank yeah. you so much for coming. Yeah, uh, sure. Getting out of your car and like. <laughs> it was great. I really enjoyed <laughs> it. Enjoyed. Yeah. Um, so um, there's still a bit of uh, the reception outside, so we can continue the conversations, and then we'll be talking. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Vazira. Thanks.